reading through the Bible in one year. August 5th, Judges 19, Acts 23, Jeremiah 33, and Psalms 3 through 4. Now, it came about in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote hill country, a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, who took a concubine for himself from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, it doesn't specifically say that's the same Levite, but it's the same area, and it's likely that it's the same guy. Yeah. But his concubine played the harlot against him. And she went away from him to his, or rather to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah, and was there for a period of four months. Okay, I'm just going to read the note on this because it's good. Okay, so this is a note that's going to cover the next three chapters. This is us wrapping up this terrible, terrible book. So let me read the note on this. The situation in Israel has deteriorated so much that some of God's people behave like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to get there. Civil war between the tribes is the result. This final story in the conclusion of Judges blames the misery of Israel on the lack of a king. Benjamin is the tribe that sins. Even more, it is the men of Gibeah, Saul's hometown, who behave like the people of Sodom. Saul's actions in 1 Samuel 11, 6 through 8, which we're going to get to, recalls the Levite's desecration of his concubine. Finally, Judah, the tribe of David, is the Lord's choice to be the leader against Benjamin. Note the similar, uh, sorry, similarity of, of the wording between verse, uh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, and 2018. The Benjaminites have practically become Canaanites. No one is without fault, however. Each tribe is doing as it sees fit. The conclusion is to be drawn um, is that a king is needed, a king from Judah and not Benjamin. David, not Saul, will qualify. Yet David, being only a man, proves unequal to the task. As later developments show, in 2 Samuel 12, 10 through 11. The Lord alone, whom the people have rejected, can be their true king. That's who should have been their king from the beginning. That's who they should have been following, but they can't follow him if they don't have a physical person in front of them. They can't just follow after the Lord when they have the priests and they have the, the sacrifices and all the things that they're supposed to be doing. They don't. That's not enough for them. They need a physical guy. They need a person to do this job for them. This is more of them just simply rejecting God. So let's read through this utterly terrible story. So again, same Levite. His concubine uh, played the whore against him um, and went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah and was there for a period of four months. So she got scared of him and ran away. Then her husband arose the Levite, and went after her to speak tenderly to her in order to bring her back, taking with him his servant and a pair of donkeys on which they can ride. So she brought him uh, to her father's house, and when the girl's father saw him, he was glad to meet him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him, and he remained with them three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. Now, on the fourth day, uh, they got up early in the morning, and he prepared to go. And the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Sustain yourself with a piece of bread, and afterward you may go. So both of them sat down and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Please be willing to spend the night. Let your heart be merry. Then the man uh, arose to go, but his father-in-law urged him so that he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he arose to go early in the morning, but the girl's father said, Please sustain yourself and wait until the afternoon. So both of them ate. When the man arose to go with his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold now, the, the day is drawn to a close. He doesn't want to leave his daughter. I get that. Please spend the night. Lo, the day is coming to an end. Spend the night here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow you may arise early for your journey that you may go home. But the man was not willing to spend the night. So he arose and departed and came to a place opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. 
and there were a pair, rather, there were with him a pair of saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. I like how she was kind of thrown in at the end. When they were near Jebus, the day was almost gone, and the servant said to his master, Please, come, let us, let us turn aside into the city of Jebusites and spend the night in it. However, his master said of him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who are not the sons of Israel, but we will go on as far as Gibeah. And he said to his servant, Come, let us approach one of these places, and we will spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they passed along and went their way, and the sun set on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside from there in order to enter and lodge in Gibeah, and when they entered, they sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. They should have. There's a law of hospitality that says that you should take care of people who are in need. Again, the people aren't following this. Then behold, an old, man, an old man was coming out of the field from his work at evening. Now the man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was staying in Gibeah. So again, he's from the same area where the, where the Levite is from. But the men of the place were Benjaminites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going? And where do you come from? He said to him, We, we are passing from Benjamin in Judah, Sorry, we are passing from Bethlehem and Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, for I am from there, and I went to Bethlehem and Judah. But now I am going to my house, and no man will take me into his house. There is both straw and fodder for our donkeys, saying, look, it's, it's not a concern about money or taking care of the animals. I've got that taken care of. And also bread and wine for me, your maidservant, and the young man who is with your servants. There is no lack of anything. The old man said to him, Peace to you. Uh, only let me take care of all your needs. However, do not spend the night in the open square. So he took him into his house and gave the donkeys fodder, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. And while they were celebrating, behold, the men of the city, certain worthless fellows, surrounded the house, pounding on the door. And they spoke to the owner of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came into your house, that we may have relations with him. They want to rape him. Then the man, the owner of the house, went out to them and said, No, no my fellows, please do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not commit this act of folly. Here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Please let me bring them out to you that you may ravish them and do whatever you wish. But do not commit such an act of folly against this man. But the men would not listen to him. So the man, the Levite, the priest of the Lord, seized his concubine, the woman who he went to go and save, bring back to his home after he spoke tenderly to her, brought her out to them, literally shoved her out the door, shut the door after her, and they raped her and abused her all night until morning, then let go of her at the approach of dawn. As the day began to dawn, the woman came and fell down at the doorway of the man's house where her master was, until full daylight. He just left her out there. He heard her screaming all night. He just went to sleep. He was fine. He's not being harmed, right? When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house, he went out to go on his way, and behold, his concubine was lying at the doorway of his house, or of the house, with her hands on the threshold. All she wanted to do was to come back in and be comforted and to be at least be saved from this, and he left her out there. He said to her, Get up and let us go. But there was no answer. She was dead. He took her corpse, threw her on the back of the donkey, and the man arose and went to his home. When he entered his house, he took a knife and laid hold of his concubine and cut her in twelve pieces limb by limb and sent her throughout the territory of Israel. Now, sorry, and all who saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or been seen from the day when the sons of Israel came up from the land of Egypt to this day, consider it, take counsel, and speak up. Now, 
there are some people who think that all the 12 pieces, he went, sent one piece to each place. More likely, he assembled all of the 12 pieces on a cart and sent her as a traveling um, display of, of disgustingness through all the places of Israel. And the point that was being made is that look at what has happened to Israel. It's been cut up and we're separate pieces. We are all one body together. Let us join back together. Also, uh, there's the fact that there's a woman, an Israelite woman, who was raped to death and then cut into 12 pieces and sent throughout the land. Every single person was just angry, trying to figure out what was going on. I'm going to read the note on this. This this offends me deeply, this whole thing. Again, I hate this book. So the 12 pieces. It is often assumed that the Levite divides the concubine into the 12 parts and sends one piece to each tribe. I already mentioned that. However, the text says that he sent her throughout all the land of Israel. That is her whole body cut into 12 pieces. Thus, it is to be a symbol to anyone who sees it that Israel is not one entity, but is acting as a divided body. The original audience of, of Judges was well aware of how Saul later cut up the oxen into 12 parts in order to summon Israel to fight against the Ammonites. This comes up later. We'll see it. Just so you know. Only two more chapters in this book. Then we're done. I wish I could say it gets better, but it really doesn't. Um... All right, so let's go on here. So Paul, after now being arrested, um, and, um, well, first off, he was, he was back in Jerusalem. Um, he was hanging out with the, with the apostles and, you know, and all the people in the church. Um, and they knew that the Jews wanted to kill him. So he went into the temple to perform vows for himself and others to prove that he's still a Jew. The same um, Asian Jews who were attacking him, those who were following him around from Lystra and Derby and all those areas, and um, probably the same ones who stoned him to death, um, they were still, sorry, they, they saw him in the temple. They presumed that he had taken his friend, whom they had seen with him before, um, who was a Greek, into the temple, which is not allowed. He didn't do it, but they just assumed he did. So they whipped up the crowd into a frenzy. Everybody's freaking out. Um, the leader of the Roman legion of that area comes rushing in, tries to whisk him out. He um, asks if he can speak to them. The, the leader says, yeah, okay, that's cool. Uh, lets him talk to them. He explains the fact that he is just like them, a zealous Jew for, for all of the Jewish things, um, but that he was saved by God. He was saved by Jesus while he was trying to kill all these people, but that um, the Jews continually war against him, so that's why he was sent to the Gentiles. They heard him say the word Gentiles. They were perfectly fine with him talking up till then, but the moment that he said um, that he was being sent to give the word of God, that God was being kind and, and offering salvation to those who aren't Jews, but Gentiles, they completely flipped out and tried to kill him again. So he got taken away. Um, he was brought into the barracks, right? They were going to whip him, but Paul... Um, after they had tied him down to whip him, so he was bound, he couldn't move anywhere, he asked them if it was legal for them to do that to him because he's, you know, a Roman citizen. The uh, leader comes by and says, whoa, hold on, what's this? He goes, yeah, I'm a Roman. You got me bound. This is against the law. Your head could roll for this. And he goes, well, hold on. I paid for my um, Roman citizenship with, with a good sum of money. And Paul devastates him by saying, yeah, that may have happened to you. I was born in a, uh, a Roman citizen. So immediately they let him go. Um, he's now a guest <laughs> staying uh, with, this, with this Roman official. Um, he probably put him into um, a kind of prison area, but he had a lot of freedom, right? He's just, he's not locked up, locked up, but they're trying to find out what to accuse him of. So... Um, they're still holding him, but he can come and go as he pleases, but he's choosing to stay there. So 
um, this leader decides, okay, the way to fix this is I'm going to bring all of these high ranking Jews together and this guy whom they hate and we'll figure out what's happening and why they want to, you know, kill him. And then maybe I can find something to accuse him of. Right. So now here he is. Paul is now responding to these people. All this is important. It all builds up to the point. So Paul, looking intently at the council, again, this is the council of the Jews, said, brethren, I have lived my life with, with a perfectly good conscience before God up till this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you try to Sorry, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But a bystander said, do you, do you refile God's high priest? Then Paul, again, a good Jew, said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, nor do they believe in angels or, or anything like that, or that, you know, anything happens after death. And the other side were Pharisees. That's his party, his group. Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and I am on trial for the hope and, and resurrection of the dead. He's literally just poking them to, to get them to war with one another. And as he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided. But the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the, the, the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes in the, uh, of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered troops to go down and to take him away from them by force and bring him back into the barracks. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 people who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as, as though you're going to examine him more closely, to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. And he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions to him. And he said, Let this, sorry, lead this young man to the commander for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called him, sorry, called me to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. So the commander took him by the hand and stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. Now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander yet the lung man, let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one of what you have notified, rather tell no one that you have notified me of these things. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea. Now, two centurions make sense because each centurion was over 100 soldiers. So basically he's saying, get your people ready. So they're going to proceed by night to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and to bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter uh, having this form, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings. 
When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I heroically came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Not exactly how it happened, but that's okay. We'll let it go. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I, I brought him down to their council, and I found him to be accused over questions about their, 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 their own law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. When these had come to Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and presented Paul to him. When he had read it, he asked him from what province he was. When he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also, giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Now, just as a note, Herod's praetorium is not a prison. Again, it's kind of a nice place. Let me roll up through the rest of the notes here. Yep, it's one of the, uh, the, the palaces and served as the quarters of the Roman governor. Again, he's not in prison at all. Not at this point. I'm going to bring up the rest of these notes here so you can see them. Now, as a quick note, if you're worried about those Jews who were threatening to, were not threatening to, I'm sorry, um, who were saying that they will not eat or drink anything until they've killed him, there is a provision if you make a... Um, a vow like this to God, right? And you are unable to keep it, not of your own ability, but because of circumstances outside of your control. You can rescind from that and you can actually eat. These people didn't just starve themselves to death because they're like, oh gosh, I wanted to kill Paul. That's not what happened. They, they are able to, because they, this is something that happened outside of their control, right? They're able to break themselves of this vow. That's nothing that they that they were trying to do. They weren't trying to weasel their way out of it. All right, let's go on to Jeremiah 33. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was still um, confined in the court of the guard, saying, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord in it, rather, the Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are broken down to make a defense against the siege ramps and against the sword. While they are coming to fight the, with the Chaldeans and to fill them with the corpses of men whom I have slain in my anger and in my wrath, and I have hidden my face from this city because of all their wickedness, behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and will rebuild them as they were at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. It will be uh, to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of all the good that I do for them. And they will fear and tremble because of all the good and, and all the peace that I make for it. Thus says the Lord, Yet again, there will be heard in this place, of which you say, It is a waste, without man and without beast, that is, the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast. The voice of joy. And the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, Give thanks to the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good, 
for his loving kindness is everlasting. And of those who bring a thank offering into the house of the Lord, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were at the first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, There will again be in this place which is a waste, without man or beast, and in all its cities a habitation of shepherds who rest their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, the flocks will again pass under the hands of the one who numbers them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fill the good work, rather, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David, that's Jesus, to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, and to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant with you, sorry, my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne, and with the Levitical priests, my ministers." As the host of heaven cannot be counted, and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not observed what this people has spoken? Saying, The two families which the Lord chose, he has rejected them. And thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, If my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth have not, sorry, I have not established, then, and only then, I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers um, over their, rather, rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, But I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. Let's go into Psalm 3 through 4. I guess Psalms 3 and 4. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me, uh, excuse me, you have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble 
and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness, not bulls and goats and blood of things, and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness into my heart, more than when uh, their, their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. That's all for today. We'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.